Good evening, and I hope uh, I'm discernible when speaking through a mask. I'm going to have to do uh, something which we've all forgotten to do, which is request anyone who's got their phones to put it on silent. <laughs> uh, with being on, doing all this online, we've forgotten to do that. Anybody needs a mask? We have uh, some masks here. Uh, so. Welcome to the ninth H.Y. Sharda Prasad Memorial Lecture, which we're holding on what would have been his 98th birthday. And this was after a pandemic-induced two-year hiatus. Thank you all for coming here. And this year is also very special for us because it's my mother's centenary, uh, which he turned, would have turned 100 a couple of months ago. Uh, many of you knew Sharda Prasad, or as we called him, Shauri, in his lifetime. Others may have only known of him as the information advisor to three prime ministers, mainly Indira Gandhi. Uh, um, I'd like to say here that if you need more information about him, please uh, you know, contact me. Do not look up Wikipedia. Uh, the article there is, as Jeff Boycott would say, rubbish. Uh, my father had, apart from his, that avatar, he had many other facets to him. He was a student leader who went to jail in the Quit India movement. He was an editor and journalist, a writer, a translator, particularly of the works of Shivram Karant and R.K. Narayan. He was a teacher briefly and someone deeply interested in music, culture, design and nature and also someone who was involved in the cultural institutions of the nation, such as NID and ICCR. The memorial lecture is intended to celebrate these diverse engagements, and I can think of no better person who embodies all these engagements than Sri Gopal Gandhi, today's speaker. <laughs> Gopalji, thank you for agreeing to deliver this lecture. Uh, I want to say that while email is generally a tedious medium, corresponding with Gopalji is to savor culture and scholarship at its very finest. I've had this pleasure when I served as a typist to my father about his encounter with Harilal Gandhi on 30th January 1948, or a few years ago about an intriguing photograph I found on the web of Gandhiji and H.O. Ali on their voyage to England. Uh, I, you know, it, it's just like an opening of a huge cultural dimension and, you know, so beautifully crafted emails I have never seen. Gopalji should need no introduction to anywhere here. There's a bio sketch which, was, which he sent me, which is characteristically understated, that he teaches at Ashoka University, writes occasionally for newspapers, has held administrative, diplomatic, and constitutional positions, and has attempted two translations, Vikram say it's a suitable boy into Hindi, and Jiu Pope's rendering of the classic Tirukkaral into contemporary English. That's Gopalji, as understated and modest a person. <laughs> the theme of Gopalji's lecture today concerns the preeminent Indian personality of the 20th century, and the principal influence on both my parents, namely Gandhiji. Uh, some years back, uh, I wrote this somewhere, Sharda Prasad was a Gandhian first and then a Nehruvian, both temporally and temperamentally. The main figure in his formative years from whom he imbibed his values was his maternal grandfather, Vajpayam Venkatsubhaya of the Servants of India Society in Madras, and an associate of Gopal Krishna Gokhale. My father got to meet Gandhiji a couple of times thanks to his friendship with Kanti Harilal Gandhi. My mother, uh, who, sent, um, who I said just turned, would have been a hundred, was also deeply influenced by Gandhi. She courted arrest in 1942 during the Quit India Movement. Some of her uncles were Gandhians. And in 1948, at age 26, she was the official court interpreter for Shankar Kishtaya in the Mahatma Gandhi murder trial at the Red Fort. So both my parents were Gandhian in their lives. Gopalji's talk today deals with a very significant period of Gandhiji's life. His first prison sentence in India 
from 1922 to 1924, coincidentally the years of birth of both my parents. Uh, he was on trial for sedition, uh, and this was a remarkable trial, or non-trial actually, that took place a hundred years ago, a few uh, weeks, you know, March 9, 1922. And this period uh, of 1922 to 24 of being in uh, uh, the Yeravada prison coincides with the tail end of the non-cooperation movement and precedes the rise of some of the revolutionary movements. I'm sure Gopalji will tell us more about it. Please welcome Shri Gopal Gap. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation, for your words of welcome, for your kindness, Sanjeev. Ladies and gentlemen, H.Y. Sharada Prasad was singular in every way. Singular in the way he saw the theatre of ambition and intrigue play out in front of him without getting pulled into it. Singular in the way he inspired trust received and kept a torrent of confidences from the honest and the dishonest. He must have had in his brain something like a shredding machine, which trashed the rubbish that got into it, as also a gadget that could store and retrieve whatever was valuable. Given his affiliation to journalism and to intellectual freedom, I believe that if this jail-going freedom fighter had not been an integral part of Mrs. Indira Gandhi's office, he would in 1975 have raised his voice of protest against press censorship and other curtailments of civil rights. But destiny's ways are impossible to explain. I offer my tribute to that egoless, guileless, and in the performance of his duties, tireless human being. I do so too to the memory of his wife, the multilingual and multifaceted Kamalamma. I should place the theme of this lecture in perspective. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was in South African prisons four times for a total of 216 days. He was in Indian prisons six times for a total of 2,119 days, making a total of 10 imprisonments over 2,335 days. This is a formidable count, but many other political prisoners, including his colleagues, were jailed oftener and for longer periods, suffering privations unimaginably harder than Gandhi had to whether as prisoner number 777 in Pretoria in 1909 or as prisoner number 8677 in Yerevada from 1922 to 1924. Rather like Nelson Mandela, prisoner number 46664 on Robben Islands, Gandhi's stature formed an aura around him which prison officials dared to dispel only at their peril. 46664 for Nelson Mandela stands for prisoner number 466 in the year 1964. At this time, a hundred years ago, that is in the spring and early summer of 1922, Gandhi had two great goals, freedom through non-violent struggle and Hindu-Muslim unity, and two means which crisscrossed non-cooperation and civil disobedience. Both goals had seemed highly realizable, but both were in jeopardy, not just because of what the state was doing, but because what fellow Indians were doing. Was his tenet of ahimsa, non-violence, really understood by the people? Were they inherently violent, inherently sectarian? The orgy of violence in Bombay, at the time of the visit of the Prince of Wales, in November 1921, and the Mopla rebellion in the Malabar area of the then Madras presidency, 
dealt Gandhi's movement towards his two goals a huge setback and gave the Raj a huge boost. In these circumstances, his arrest was foregone. But before his own arrest, others were jailed across the nation. The brothers Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali, Gandhi's stalwart colleagues in the Khilafat movement that had brought his ideal of Hindu-Muslim unity almost to fruition, were in jail already. By early December 1921, Lala Lajpatraya, Pandit Motila Nehru and 32-year-old Jawaharlal Nehru were arrested in Allahabad. At his resilient and typical best, Gandhi said these arrests filled him with joy. And he sent a telegram to Mrs. Motila Nehru, the intrepid Suruprani, congratulating her. And a telegram to her daughter-in-law also, Jawaharlal's wife, Kamala. President-elect of the Indian National Congress, C.R. Das, was arrested on December 2. Gandhi wired congratulations to his wife, Basanti Devi. Maulana Azad, then of age 32, was arrested on the same day as Das. Patriotism and sedition had become, for the Raj, synonymous. And patriotism and jail-going had become, for freedom fighters, synonymous. The struggle would have reached its zenith but for the bizarre trauma in Chaurichora in 1922, February 4. Its gory details need no recounting. But even as an agonized Gandhi froze the movement, the Raj dug its claws in, blaming Gandhi for having let loose an uncontrollable frenzy in the country. Abul Kalam Azad got his sentence towards the end of February one year's, one year's rigorous imprisonment. His wife, Zulekha, sent to Gandhi an amazing telegram, telegraphic message, telegram letter. My husband, says Zulekha, has been sentenced to only one year's imprisonment. This is astoundingly less than what I was waiting for. I offer my humble service to fill the gap caused by his absence. In an article in Young India on November 23, 1922, Gandhi congratulated Zulekha. Rumor is said to fill vacuums, which are left by reliable records. So does imagination fill vacuums in the absence of historical recounting. And therefore, let me imagine a scene. Kasturba says at this point to Gandhi, in terse Gujarati, you don't seem to forget your friends' wives when they are in difficulty. But maybe sometimes when marching off to jail, you can spare a thought for your wife also. <laughs> Imagination ends. In the same issue of Young India, February 23, as carried his piece on Zulekha, Gandhi wrote his famous article, Shaking the Mains, in which he said, the fight that was commenced in 1920 is a fight to the finish. Whether it lasts one month or one year or many months or many years, and whether the representatives of Britain re-enact all the indescribable orgies of the mutiny days with redoubled force, or whether they do not. The arrest, his first in India, followed by a jailing, came at 10 p.m. on March 10, 1922. His Young India articles were cited as a cause, its printer and publisher Shankaral Banker being arrested as well. As he was being taken away to the prison, in the prison van, an associate of Gandhi's in Sabarmati Ashram that night, Indulal Yagnik said, Jail will be a good nursing home for you. Kasturba, we may be sure, was not amused at all. But Gandhi laughingly said to Indulal Yagnik, Of course, of course, that is so, meaning it will be a nursing home, which was prescient. There is something called being prescient, something called being positive. 
It was going to be said of Gandhi years later. I think apocryphally, but not wrong in its atma, that on one of the days when he was embarking on an indefinite fast, Gandhi sent for a pair of new dentures. <laughs> he carried with him to his prison trial seven books. The Ramayana in Tulsidas's rendering, which was his absolutely favorite work, the Gita, the Quran, a presentation copy of the Sermon on the Mount sent by schoolboys of a high school in California, an old dictionary he prized, and an Urdu manual presented to him by Maulana Azad. He was looking forward to using his new nursing home for catching up on reading not just the books he was taking with him, but as many as he could access in the prison. And he had some writing also in his mind. Present at the trial on March 18, 1922, in Amdavad, where Kasturba, Madan Mohan Malaviya, Sarojini Naidu, Jawaharlal Nehru, freshly released from his own prison term, Vallabhai Patel with his daughter Mani Ben, the Andhra leader T. Prakasan, the Tilakite N. C. Kelkar, and Tagore's niece, the poet Sarla Devi Chaudhrani. Gandhi famously pleaded guilty. All of us know his statement. I am not going to read it out except for two lines. It is impossible for me to dissociate myself from the diabolical crimes of Chauri Chora or the mad outrages in Bombay and Madras. I wanted to avoid violence. I want to avoid violence. Nonviolence is the first article of my faith. It is also the last article of my creed, but I had to make a choice. I do not ask for mercy. And he did not get mercy. A still silence descended on the hall as the sentence of six years under Section 124A of IPC was pronounced. Banker getting one year. Permitted to respond after the sentence was read out. Gandhi said the sentence was as light as any judge would inflict on him. There is no writing, there is no record typically of records, to say what Kasturba's reaction was, what she said, what she felt, God knows. God knows. Gandhi's and bankers' spare belongings included their charkhas. He was not surprised, Gandhi says, when on reaching the jail he was told by the superintendent, a Lieutenant Colonel Dalziel, sounds like a word of name of Italian origin, that he could not allow the spinning wheels which were confiscated. Gandhi said to Dalziel that spinning was a vow with him. Superintendent was unconvinced. I, however, felt totally undisbursed and totally undisturbed, says Gandhi. I am a se seasoned jailbird. I went on a semi-fast the next morning. The superintendent promptly gave orders for the spinning wheels to be restored to him. A jail committee consisting of the collector, a clergyman and some others came the next day. Gandhi mentioned to them that Banker suffered from nervousness and that he should be kept in the same cell as him. At this, one of the committee said, nonsense. Within an hour, a warder came and removed Banker to another quarter. Gandhi writes that Banker was torn away from him and removed to that quarter. Gandhi was now an isolation prisoner. He was not to talk to anybody, not see anybody. And in the sudden hush of the prison, where he now was, he had become overnight a number. 8677, banker being 8676. Beyond roll calls and such like, Gandhi answered to the number 8677 by another number, zero. Zero self-pity, zero depression, and above all, zero idleness. The Yaroda Central Prison allowed one visit once every three months. His son Devdas 
and Rajagopalachari, who had come out of his own imprisonment in Vellore, were let in on April 1, 1922. After the interview, Rajaji told Bombay Chronicle, which was a very free newspaper, B.G. Horniman having been its editor. Rajaji told Bombay Chronicle, the superintendent was in his chair. Mahatmaji standing in front of the table. He had to continue standing throughout the interview. Mahatmaji is kept in one of the cells intended for solitary confinement and locked in during nights. At our interview, the superintendent promised to replace the crude pot by a commode. The night pot has to be in the cell during the nights. Mahatmaji is not allowed his own bed. He is given the usual two jail blankets. I was curious to ask, says Rajaji, if he had any pillow. He said he had none. When I expressed surprise, the superintendent interposed that a pillow was a luxury. He has not been deprived of his writing paper, says Rajaji, and his pen, which he is now using only to learn Urdu by himself. Mahatmaji was in his usual single loincloth. He did not seem to us to be in good health, though the jailer told us he has gained in weight. This is Rajaji's description. Five days later, J. F. Gennings, the then Director of Information, Government of Bombay, Director of Information being a position which Shardaji would have immediately understood in all its intricacies, complexities and humour. <laughs> J. F. Gennings, the Director of Information, issued a contradiction to what Rajaji had said. It is untrue, says Gennings, that he is locked in at night. The sleeping cell he is allowed to keep open at night. Half the yard is reserved for him to exercise and space is ample for the purpose. A pillow, in addition to the usual bedding, was supplied when it was asked for. A commode for use at night was placed in the cell on medical grounds for the benefit of the prisoner. Now, Bombay Chronicle did not let the matter rest there. It asked Rajaji for a rejoinder to the director's rejoinder. Rajaji, of course, obliged with a sharp lawyer's wit, saying every item in the government note which pretends to contradict my statement is based on arrangements made subsequent to my interview. The newspaper then asked Rajaji, do you think non-cooperators should be differently treated from common prisoners? Rajaji replied, all the civilized world over, political prisoners are treated differently from common prisoners. Mahatmaji and all non-cooperating prisoners are quite prepared to be treated as common prisoners. But let there be no pretense of civilization on the part of the government. Bombay Chronicle's last question to Rajaji was the most important. What was Mahatmaji's response to the treatment accorded to him? Rajaji's answer was, it is said, Mahatmaji is completely satisfied with the treatment he is receiving. This is so. This is so because, as Mahatmaji told me at the interview, he does not expect the jail authorities to know anything about what a human being needs apart from the requirements of his animal body. Mahatmaji was completely satisfied even when he was made to stand throughout the interview. And when I referred to a pillow, Mahatmaji smiled and said it was not necessary. But such treatment accorded to a man of that character, even for a single day, whatever improvements may hereafter be made, shows the mentality with which we have to deal. Mentality. Devadas, on seeing his father made to stand in front of the seated superintendent, had burst out weeping aloud and it was with difficulty that Gandhi was able to restrain his son. He should have realized, Gandhi wrote in the first of his permissible letters, 
addressed to Hakim Ajmal Khan, then the Congress president. He should have realized that I was a prisoner, and as such, I had no right to sit in the presence of the superintendent. Seats might and should have been offered to Rajagopalachari and Devdas. Now, Director of Information, Gennings, bless his credulous soul, was perturbed by Rajaji's rejoinder to his rejoinder. And he wrote to the Inspector General of Prisons, F.O.N. Mel. This is Jennings writing. Jennings or Gennings, I'm not sure how his name is pronounced. He spells it with a G. Dear Sir, a point to which criticism is being directed is that Mr. Gandhi was made to stand for an hour while the interview took place. Sir, may I take it that this is a standing rule of the jail? <laughs> the Inspector General, bless his bureaucratic acculturation, referred the query to the Yeroda prison superintendent, Colonel Dalziel, had never met a prisoner of this kind. Replying to the IG, Colonel Dalziel said, yes, the director of information is correct in suggesting that a prisoner stands in the presence of the superintendent, even the European jailer, however senior he may be, stands in the presence of the superintendent. Hitherto, it has not been considered infra dig for a prisoner to stand. The key word here is hitherto. Things before Gandhi were hitherto. Things after Gandhi were thereafter. Truth is notoriously ahead of imagination. Dalziel then created for the IG's edification the whole episode, saying that when number 8677 and his visitors were to come into his room, he was engaged, Dalziel was engaged, in counting the ammunition stocks of the prison, a monthly exercise done on the first of every month. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Orwell, Premchand, Kalki, Krishnamurti could not have imagined a more tell-tale setting. I do not know what Superintendent Dalziel thought of General Dyer, but it is not unlikely that as he was seated there counting cartridges, one clang, two clang, reaching perhaps a hundred, if not more, he might have thought of the 1,650 which are said to have been fired on innocence, men, women, many of them old, and children, including a six-week-old baby in Jaliawala Bagh on April 13, 1919. And as 8677 was shown into the room full of bullets, the contrast could not have been greater. Dalziel continues, this correspondence between these officials is from the confidential records of the police now opened in the government of Maharashtra, Bombay. Mr. Gandhi Jr. called my attention to the fact that his father was standing in front of me. There was no suggestion made that M.K. Gandhi was or would be fatigued, but stress was put on the fact that the prisoner was standing in the presence of the superintendent. It appeared to me, says Dalziel to Mel, that the offence was not really so much that the prisoner was standing, but that the superintendent was sitting. Now, maltreatment is not about absolute principles. It is about real and perceived dealing, what Rajaji simply called simple mentality. It is the mentality of the jail, the mentality of the jailer, the mentality of those who control the jailer. The letter to Hakim Ajmal Khan was referred by Dalziel to headquarters. Can it be sent? Can it not be sent? Should it be sent? Should it be held back? And it was decided not to allow it to be sent. Now Gandhi pens a letter. It has to be conceded on behalf of historiography, that the generous giving of paper and pen and ink, reams of it and pots of it to Gandhi, was a combination of generosity, 
practicality, but may have also something to do with the fact that it kept a window open to his thinking for every syllable that he spoke and read and wrote would then go through the chortles of government. Gandhi pens a letter about this withholding of his letter from prisoner 8677 to the government of Bombay. With reference to the government orders passed on prisoner's letter to Hakim Ji Ajmal Khan, a friend of the prisoners, prisoner 8677 begs to say, the implication is, in prisoner's opinion, dangerous in the extreme. It being that an Indian prison is a secret department. Prisoner contends that Indian prisons are an open public department subject to criticism by the public in the same manner as any other department. M.K. Gandhi, prisoner number 8677. Now, on or around this day, a hundred years ago, that is around April 15, 1922, Gandhi was reading side by side his Ramayana in Tulsidas's version, a favorite with him, and also the Holy Quran. Now, this was not an act in piety, though his natural devotionalism is not to be underestimated. It was a civilizational exercise meant to entrench his faith in India's destiny in pluralism, lately challenged by the abatement of the Khilafat movement in which he had set his heart and the horrors in Malabar. That he was reading Tulsidas in Avadhi and while reading the Quran doubtless in an English translation was also trying to get a grip over Arabic and Urdu says more than anything else can of his sense of India's destiny. A cryptic and yet chilling entry, chilling entry in his daily diary for May 20, 1922 says, Haji, who Haji is, nobody knows. I don't. Perhaps Mr. Anil Noria will be able to find out. Haji was taken to a dark cell yesterday. There's a diary entry for June 30, Saturday, that says, Yesterday, finished reading a book on an episode in the life of the Prophet in Urdu, and started reading the account of the companions of the Prophet. If writing and sending of letters and manuscripts were constricted for 8677, his reading also stumbled on a block. Towards the end of 1922, Colonel Dalziel was temporarily promoted as Acting Inspector General of Prisons, and in his place came Major S. Winifred Jones. To Jones, Gandhi applied for two Gujarati magazines to be supplied to him, Vasant and Samalochak. Jones, a very different man from Dalziel, was keen to get the magazines supplied to 8677. He asked Dalziel for clearance. After a perusal of nine sample copies of the Dalziel, through, I'm sure, Dalziel's translators, he declined to give permission, with no explanations being given. Now Gandhi remonstrated by saying, if this decision is not altered, it will deprive me of the opportunity of keeping myself in touch with current Gujarati literature. Dalziel would not budge. I think any magazine allowed to M.K. Gandhi should be like Caesar's wife, beyond suspicion. Dalziel's knowledge of ancient literature is a matter of separate study. On Gandhi insisting on an explanation for the refusal, Dalziel said, I do not think this prisoner should be encouraged to argue. In my opinion, he is now impertinent. The final no from Dalziel, elicited from Gandhi, a response that contains a vision, nothing less than a vision for prisons and prisondom anywhere. Gandhi says, 
I regard these refusals to let me have the use of periodicals as a punishment in addition to that awarded by the convicting judge. A superintendent of a prison is in fact a guardian of the prisoners under his charge. Rightly or wrongly, I believe that even as a prisoner I have certain rights. I have the right to have pure air, water, food and clothing. Similarly, I have the right to have such mental nourishment given to me as I am used to. And then in a typical Gandhi clincher, he says, I asked for no favours, and if the Inspector General thinks that any single thing of convenience has been given to me as a favour, let it be withdrawn. On the morning of February 1923, Gandhi heard some screaming and some men shouting the word flogging. A short while after, he saw four or five young men in gunny clothes being marched. One of them had a bare back. They were all walking very slowly and with bent backs. Gandhi observed they were in pain. He concluded they must have been flogged. They were all prisoners from Mulshi Peta near Pune, where they had protested through Satyagraha, not inspired by Gandhi, but by Senapati Bapat, against the building of a dam across the rivers Nira and Peta, which they believed would submerge lands and fields. The Satyagrahi prisoners had been assigned the task of grinding corn as part of rigorous imprisonment, but as political prisoners they had considered this unfit for them and refused to do it, for which they were flogged. Gandhi asked Major Jones for permission to see these men. He might be able to persuade them, he said, to reconsider their position. Satyagra, he said, requires a prisoner to obey all reasonable jail regulations and certainly do the work given. Major Jones thanked him, but knowing the Raj's attitude, regretted the offer could not be accepted. On April 21, 23, Gandhi records in his diary that he felt a very severe stomach pain. Two days on, the pain subsided, and he writes, The Major looked after me very well. I suffered very much. I was examined by Colonel Maddock, the Surgeon General. Over May 1923, he was under regular observation, and government was taking no chances. On June 6, he finished reading the story of Aurobindo's imprisonment. Karavasini Kahini in Gujarati translation. The significance cannot be missed. Of this prisoner, undergoing a sentence for sedition, being able to read the account of the celebrated and life changing imprisonment of another prisoner charged with defiance of the state. And around the same time, Gandhi began writing by dictation to fellow prisoner Indula Liagani, among other things vivid descriptions of his own kahani in the different karavases in South Africa in the shape of the remarkable book translated into English as the history of Satyagraha in South Africa. I had no books of reference in jail, he says. Although he wrote without books of reference at hand, he said, I must ask the reader not to imagine that any single item in this work is inaccurate or that there is the least exaggeration. His intention was not to write a detailed history but to record his experience so that the book may be helpful in the ongoing Satyagraha struggles in India. Meanwhile, the fate of the Mulshi Peta prisoners continued to disturb his tranquility. On June 29, when he was still very much under the cloud of illness and perhaps pain as well, Gandhi wrote to Jones again requesting that he be accommodated with the Mulshi Peta prisoners so that he could induce them to look at their own imprisonment in the proper light and tell them not to shirk work. If this could not be done, he said he could be at least permitted to visit them as occasion may require. Ten days passed with no reply from the government. Dalziel by this time was back, his temporary promotion having concluded. Gandhi wrote to Dalziel on July 9, I feel about these fasting prisoners exactly as I would about a blood brother unless some satisfactory reply is received by the end of the day, 
purely as a solace to my own soul and for no other reason, I propose to fast from tomorrow, not denying myself water and salt, till a satisfactory solution is reached, that is, till the hunger strike ends. Now, a fast does something. A fast in prison does something more. And a fast by Gandhi in prison does something incalculably so. On July 10, the next day, Dalziel requested number 8677 to please postpone your fast for 48 hours for my sake. The governor of Bombay, Sir George Lloyd, sent on July 11, third day, a message through the Inspector General of Police to say that Gandhi will be allowed to meet the prisoners and that flogging will be resorted to only when and if the prisoner attacked jail officials and then again only after obtaining government's permission. Gandhi records simply, I persuaded the prisoners to give up their agitation, their fast. Number 8677, jailed for sedition, hailed by the nation as its leader, whether in jail or free, had saved Yeroda Central Prison from potential disgrace and the governor from a major contretemps, and all this while in physical agony. No aspect of life in jail escaped Gandhi during that term. I will not shock the reader with any details he was to recapitulate, but the discovery of the existence of unnatural crimes produced one of the greatest shocks. All the officials who spoke to me about them said that under the existing system, it was impossible to prevent them. And as if anticipating modern 21st century debates on what is natural and what is unnatural, what is consensual and what is not, Gandhi says of the Yerevda jail cases, let the reader understand that in the majority of these cases, the consent of the victim is lacking. What Gandhi described was not custodial torture, but it was torture under custodial watch. Have things changed? Custodial torture in India is generally regarded as a barbarism belonging to the Middle Ages. It is in fact as primeval as inequality among human beings. It is as ancient as power, as chronic as bullying. Custodial torture is also as deathless as envy and fear and lust. Successive governments of India in not ratifying India's initial signing of the UN Convention Against Torture, even with reservations, as Pakistan and Bangladesh have done, and in its continuing the death penalty, albeit with restraint, have only reflected majority sentiment in India, which has shown no discomfort whatsoever over it. But as Gandhi's intervention in the Mulshi Peta matter tells us, a determined effort even by a few or even by one, can sometimes make a difference, howsoever small. It must be noted here that the Dravida Munnetra Karagam in Tamil Nadu has consistently opposed the death penalty, even though the iconic philosopher Tiruvalluvar writes approvingly of the practice in the Tirukkural. Committed people and organizations working for India to ratify its signature on the UN Convention Against Torture and for the abolition of the death penalty, are therefore doing something that is as difficult as it is noble. They may draw some meaning from Gandhi's one-line observation about Haji being taken to a dark cell, and some strength from his decisive intervention on flogging. This Amrit Mahotsav of Azadi provides a felicitous moment for the government of India to enlarge against personal securities all political prisoners and under trial prisoners, except, I would say, those charged with murder, rape and terrorism. 
Now to return to Gandhi for a moment. On January 8, 1924, he had a restless night with severe stomach pain. Colonel Cecil Maddock, the surgeon general, asked for him to be transferred post-haste to Sassoon Hospital in Pune, where appendicitis was diagnosed, and on January 12 performed the surgery even, even as a thunderstorm was lashing Pune and of course the hospital as well. Not surprisingly, in the middle of the surgery, the storm knocked out the bijli. A flashlight was brought to substitute the supply of power, three nurses holding up the flashlight. Then even that conked out. The surgery was completed by Colonel Maddock finally in the light of a hurricane lamp. Gandhi was ordered to be released on February 5, 1924. He left Pune on March 10, 1924, exactly two years after he had been brought with Shankarlal Banker to that nursing home. Let us not imagine that prisons are for others. Like hospitals, they are for all, including everyone and anyone who falls foul of the law. And so it would be salutary to ask, what does jailbird Gandhi's imprisoning tell us? Five things, basically. We must strive for prison reform to make jails and jailings compatible with human decency. In prison, real or metaphorical, we suffer, but we must know that others, like the Molshi Peta prisoners, are probably suffering far more than us. Prisons are feared. Fear is a prison. We are all, if in the grip of fear or any fear, in prisons of our own making. We can be free and yet in the prison called fear. We can be in prison and fear free. The only prison is the prisoner's mind, in which the space cleared for exercise is an ability Difficult always, but almost impossible sometimes, to not let one's thoughts be changed. My primary intention in this lecture has been to present cameos for their own sake from Gandhi's first and hugely instructive imprisonment on the occasion of its centenary. But I've also wanted to draw the following three inferences from it. Gandhi was jailed in 1922 for what he had written in his journal Young India, even as Lokamanya Tilak had been in 1908 for an article in his journal Kesari. In other words, Gandhi's first and defining imprisonment was not in his capacity as a dominant figure in the Congress, not a mass leader being looked up to by millions as a Mahatma. It was as a writer, a journalist and editor. I might add, given the substance and the range of his readership, a scholar as well. It was as a writer, a journalist, an editor, a fact which Sharadaji would have appreciated that he was in jail. This carries a huge salience today when the right to free speech in almost all of South Asia is under great stress. The first goal that took Gandhi in Yerevda to prison was Swaraj. If a hundred years ago it was necessary to win Swaraj, it is necessary now to strive to preserve Swaraj. An uninked treaty between the numerically, politically, organizationally and techno-commercially strong challenges the soul of Swaraj, which is equity in freedom, not just in India, but in several countries across the world. In Gandhi's second goal of Hindu-Muslim unity, he succeeded partially but poignantly, laying down his life in the process. Today, where there was coexistence with occasional and traumatic ruptures, there is now endemic distrust, chronic disinformation and 24-7 danger. 
In this year of Azadi's Amrit Mahotsav, we should not be seeing the zahar of communal hatred spreading. A strong prevalent sentiment today is, but who is to lead us today? On April 15, 1924, in an interview to the Hindu, Gandhi said nonviolent movements by the committed can do without leadership. The road, he said, is narrow, I admit, but it is straight and therefore simple. Only the will is required, but no cunning, no cunning. Gandhi had that will, of course, plus the words to match the will. From the amount he read and wrote in that prison, we can say that the goddess of learning was never far from Gandhi's work. April 15, 1924, coincidentally, was the day when a child born in Bangalore was felicitously named by its parents the gift of Saraswati, Sharada Prasad. Thank you, Gopalji. I will uh, I'll allow the audience to ask a couple of questions, if anyone has questions. It is only voluntary, there is no necessity <laughs> to ask questions. So I will... <laughs> Suresh ji. Oh, yeah. Sir, you mentioned that uh, Gandhi be carrying an Urdu manual given by Mohan Azad. Did he master the Urdu script or literature? No, I, I would not say that he mastered it. I would say he, he strove very hard to master it. He, I think, achieved a fair degree of success in being able to write the script. Not just his own name, but also a few words and sentences. In his letters to Rehana Tayyibji, he tried very deliberately to write in Urdu, not being afraid of mistakes, in fact valuing corrections so that he could do it more. Gopal, you could, you could sit to me. You'd like me to sit? I can sit also. That does not mean that you have to churn questions in your mind. Not necessary. Not necessary. Sanjeev, I think. Please. Yeah. Yeah. You may have to repeat the question to me if I can't hear it. The treatment of those who disagreed with the government or fell afoul of it. I can't get you. I in Gandhiji's times, the treatment of those who fell foul of the government uh, is well known. Now, I do not know whether uh, the severity of the treatment received today is higher or less than it was in those days. Not having been either a jailer or a prisoner, I am not able to answer that question from experience. But I would say, as I think I said in the course of my words, that prisons across the world are today vastly better sites of penological correction than they used to be. In India also, they are called correctional homes rather than prisons. And I know from having visited correctional homes in West Bengal that some extraordinary improvements have taken place in the running of jails. And the prisoners in one of them, one of, in fact, Alipur, the famous jail where Aurobindo was, the inmates were encouraged to and became extremely good in theatre and produced plays by Tagore, including the post office. 
and were not only able to show them outside the prison, but in fact went outside the country with, on a regulated visit to show. Does this mean that custodial torture has ended? No, no, it has not. It has not. But I think both things are happening. There's a great deal of improvement. There's also much more scope for improvement than before. And I think every government, every government in India, post-independence India, has refrained from taking a stand on the abolishing of, or the, or the controlling of custodial torture, which should include mental torture. With, with that, I would like to thank all of you. And this was a wonderful thank you, lecture. Thank you. And really great comments to Thank you all for taking time out and coming. It's very special to us and to the family uh, that we could have you all here. And I'm once again, I would like to thank Gopalji for this very, very thought-provoking lecture where we are still a long way to go in how we treat other human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you.